We move on now to talk about another topic related to the plasma membrane. And the focus now will be on active transport. First, let's define active transport. Active transport is a process that is used to drive the uphill transport of molecules in the energetically unfavorable direction. This type of transport requires energy, which is provided by another coupled reaction. There are two different types of active transport. The one that is driven by ATP hydrolysis and the one that is driven by ion gradients. The sodium potassium pump exemplifies the type of active transport that is driven by ATP hydrolysis. The sodium potassium pump is made of two main subunits, the alpha subunit and the beta subunit. The alpha subunit contains 10 different transmembrane domains whereas the beta subunit contains only one transmembrane domain. Furthermore, the beta subunit contains a large extracellular domain which contains three glycosylation sites. The activity of the sodium potassium pump is absolutely essential for cell physiology and for many different mammalian cell types about 25% of all the ATP consumed by the cell is used to provide the energy that is needed by this pump. The sodium potassium pump works by undergoing a cyclic series of conformational changes. Initially, the pump is in a conformation that allows the exposure of a cavity that is located inside the pump to the intracellular environment. In this position, in this conformation, the pump also exposes three high affinity binding sites for sodium to the intracellular environment. This leads to the binding of sodium ions to those high binding affinity sites. And this is followed by the phosphorylation of the pump by a cellular kinase. This is the step that involves the use of ATP. The phosphorylation of the pump triggers a conformational change on the pump, which then exposes the cavity of the pump to the extracellular environment and changes the affinity of the sodium binding sites for sodium ions, therefore triggering the release of the sodium ions to the outside of the cell. Upon the release of the sodium ions, two high affinity binding sites for potassium are exposed. These high affinity binding sites for potassium allow the trapping of potassium ions and this leads to the dephosphorylation of the pump. And as expected, when the phosphate is lost from the pump, this triggers another conformational change that now leads to the cavity of the pump to be exposed once again to the intracellular environment and for the loss of affinity for the potassium ions which triggers the release of the potassium ions into the inside of the cell. The pump is at this stage ready for another cycle of transport. The activity of the sodium potassium pump generates a dramatic difference between the intracellular and extracellular concentration of sodium and potassium. Importantly, potassium is the only ion that is present in higher concentration within the cell than outside the cell. And therefore, potassium is the main contributor to the potential, the electrochemical potential across the plasma membrane. So you could say that potassium potentiates the cell. The large difference in intracellular and extracellular concentration of sodium and potassium has many important uses for the cell. First, the sodium gradient is used to drive the active transport of a large variety of molecules in and outside the cell. Second, the difference in sodium and potassium concentrations helps maintain osmotic balance and by doing that it helps maintain cell volume. To understand this idea, keep in mind that there is a very high concentration of organic compounds within the cell. And this concentration is substantially higher than the concentration of such organic compounds outside the cell.
This difference in concentrations will drive the continuous influx of water from the outside to the inside of the cell. Remember, the plasma membrane is fully permeable to water. So, if the concentration of organics is substantially higher inside the cell, water will try to continuously come into the cell to compensate that concentration gradient. However, the difference in sodium and potassium concentrations that is generated by the sodium potassium pump neutralizes that trend because a direct consequence of the sodium potassium gradient is that many other ions are in substantially higher concentration in the extracellular environment and this equalizes the total amount of solutes that is things that are in solution in the inside of the cell versus the outside of the cell so if you have equal amounts of solutes at both sides of the membrane then the net flow of water into the cell and outside the cell will be zero therefore maintaining osmotic pressure therefore producing osmotic balance and therefore contributing to maintain cell volume. Another example of ATP dependent transporters is given by the so-called ABC transporters. The ABC transporters are called this way because they contain an ATP binding cassette, therefore ABC. These proteins are widely distributed in nature and in fact they are present all the way throughout the evolutionary scale, starting in bacteria and going all the way up to mammalian cells. In bacteria, the ABC transporters are usually used to drive the import into the cell of various nutrients, including ions, sugars, and amino acids. In eukaryotic cells, these ABC transporters are mostly used to drive the export out of the cell of toxic substances. And the best example of these is the elimination of toxic drugs by the MDR gene. MDR stands for multiple drug resistance gene, and this is a gene that is usually amplified in many cancers, therefore making cancer cells, certain types of cancer cells, very resistant to chemotherapeutic treatment. The basic structure of the ABC transporters is very well conserved throughout the evolutionary scale. All of these proteins have two copies of the same structure, so they are dimeric proteins, and they all contain six transmembrane domains. In addition to that, the cytosolic region of the protein contains a hinge region, which is responsible for dimer formation, and also contains the ATP binding cassette. One of the members of the ABC transporter family is directly related to a human disease, cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is the most frequent lethal inherited disease in humans, and it is substantially more frequent in Caucasians than in any other race. The disease is directly associated to mutations affecting the so-called CFTR gene. This gene is called CFTR because it codes for the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator. The product of the gene is a membrane protein that forms a chlorine channel. This channel regulates the flux of chlorine ions across the plasma membrane, and the lack of function of this channel results in abnormally thick and a sticky mucus that accumulates in the respiratory and digestive tracts. Therefore, all the symptoms of this disease are related to the obstruction of the respiratory airways as well as the digestive ducts in the body. So most people affected by this disease will develop substantial respiratory deficiencies and frequent respiratory infections that altogether will lead to early death. The average age of death for people suffering this condition used to be in the early 20s, but thanks to substantial advancements in the treatment of this condition, the life expectancy for these individuals has been increased up to early to mid-30s.
Nevertheless, and despite all improvements in treatment, cystic fibrosis will always lead to severe respiratory dysfunction, which produces a substantial decrease in the quality of life for the individuals that suffer this condition. A new very important development in the treatment of this disease has been the development of a new drug that was approved last year by the FDA. This drug was developed thanks to the detailed knowledge of the molecular defects that underlie the condition and shows how molecular biology can lead the way to the development of truly innovative treatments against human diseases. Now, while the development of this new drug, Calideco, marks a real groundbreaking moment for biomedical sciences, there is an underlying issue, and that is the cost of the treatment. A potential alternative for the treatment of this disease is gene therapy. And it is important to mention that cystic fibrosis was the first human disease for which gene therapy was attempted. In those initial trials, a copy of the normal gene was introduced into the affected individuals using adenoviruses as vectors. Adenoviruses are viruses that usually affect the respiratory tract of people, and they are considered to be some of the viruses that are responsible for the common cold. Those initial trials prove that the introduction of a normal copy of the gene led to some relief of the symptoms normally associated to cystic fibrosis. However, it was also seen that the normal immune response of the individuals was responsible for clearing out the adenoviruses that had been used as vectors, therefore leading to elimination of the normal copy of the gene that had been introduced. To this day, cystic fibrosis is still considered a good target for the development of gene therapy. Moving on, let's now talk about the active transport that is driven by ion gradients. The best example for this type of transport is given by a sodium glucose transporter that is located in the apical side of cells lining the intestinal lumen. This glucose slash sodium transporter has the ability to bind to sodium ions, which, by the way, are in substantially higher concentration outside the cell than inside the cell, and in the process it has the ability to also bind glucose molecules. The binding of sodium and glucose triggers a conformational change in the transporter that leads to the exposure of the internal cavity of the transporter to the intracellular side of the plasma membrane. A subsequent conformational change in the transporter leads to a release of the sodium ions as well as the glucose molecule to the inside of the cell. Notice how the movement of glucose molecules is happening against its concentration gradient and therefore can be considered to be active transport. So this glucose sodium transporter couples the energetically favorable movement of sodium from high to low concentration with the movement of glucose against its concentration gradient. This type of transport is considered to be symport, that is, is the coupled transport of two different molecules in the same direction. Even though one of the two molecules is moving against its concentration gradient. And now for a broader perspective on how all of this works together, let's take a look at what is happening in those cells that line up the small intestine. First, remember that the plasma membrane of the epithelial cells that line up our intestine have different domains. On one end, they have the apical domain, which is the one that is facing the lumen of our intestine. Then they also have the region that is involved in forming tight junctions with other epithelial cells. 
and then they also have the basal lateral domain, which is the one that is exposed to the connective tissues. At the apical domain, these cells have the glucose sodium transporter, the one that is moving glucose against its concentration gradient. That allows for glucose to be taken in from the lumen of the intestine into the epithelial cells, therefore allowing the epithelial cell to accumulate a substantial amount of glucose inside the cell. The resulting high concentration of glucose then drives the flow of glucose from the inside of the cell into peripheral circulation through the plasma membrane by the use of the glucose transporter. This glucose transporter is working in favor of the concentration gradient for glucose and therefore is acting by facilitated diffusion. An exemplifies uniport, that is a transporter that is moving one molecule across the plasma membrane. Finally, the concentration gradient that is required to drive the import of glucose into the epithelial cell is provided by the low concentration of sodium that is present within the cell. This is what drives the transport of sodium from the outside of the cell into the inside of the cell, which is what allows the coupling of the transport of sodium with that of glucose. This sodium concentration gradient across the plasma membrane is established by the sodium potassium pump. So, in the end, it can be stated that the ability of our epithelial cells to absorb glucose from our intestine into peripheral blood circulation is all given by the activity of the sodium potassium pump. Now, considering that the sodium potassium pump is also the one responsible for generating the gradient that allows for the generation of nerve impulses or action potentials in neurons, then you could argue that human life, everything that we associate with human life, is dependent on the activity of the sodium potassium pump. The last type of active transport driven by ion gradients is antiport. In antiport, the movement of an ion in the favorable direction is coupled of the movement of another ion in the opposite direction against its concentration gradient. And this is exemplified by the sodium calcium transporter as well as by this sodium hydrogen transporter.